The following presentation can be found in document form at obryproject.info. That's O B R Y P R O J E K T dot I N F O on the resources page. And now, the Obery Project presents Midian, a defined land and people or a descriptive generalization. Is the Medin or Midian of the early scriptures or so called Old Testament as the transliterations have caused us to come to know it as, being a defined geographic nation and a definable people, or is it, as its cognates, root families and context would suggest, a general term for a non-defined location and people? To answer this, the forms of Medin, M-D-Y-N, utilized in scripture must be examined carefully. One thing to remember when examining any given word is the potential for hiding words in the text under the guise of them being other words. This is the Masoretic mix-up. But as words do have meaning, and Obery is a language of meaningful, immutable, knowable glyphs, all occurrences of Medin should bear at least a close resemblance to one another under most circumstances. There are, of course, sensible variations to this. The most common being when one bears a name that is the same as a common word. Then, context is king. But we will find that this is not the case with Medin, commonly known as Midian. Medin M-D-Y-N, is not only translated Midian, as well as Midianite with the Y suffix and Midianitish with the Y-T suffix, which really ought to be translated woman of Midian in the least, but also as judgment, strife, and contentions. If a simple E suffix is added, not uncommon in nouns as a way of softening, generalizing, or dispersing a more rigid, specific, locative noun, a great many entries occur in which Medine is now province or provinces. Still of further interest is the number of times Medun, Medin, and Medin are successfully translated in the same basic way, contentions, strife, discord, etc., thus further lending credence to the assertion that all occurrences of Medin ought to be viewed in common, that is, those occurrences, depending a bit on their part of speech, should be understood as having the same essential meaning. Again, the exception to this, as stated above, is that it would be a proper name and then the context and reasons derived from the text would dictate this. Before I continue, though, the origin of this paper is twofold. The first of which was the very real trouble I had writing a chapter for my forthcoming book, The Bible Verses the Middle East, on the Exodus and Moses' trip to Mount Horeb slash Sinai. The location of Midian, or pinning it down rather, kept me going in circles until I finally had to just let the chapter alone for a later time. I now understand the nature of the problems I had. The second issue that led me to this study and this paper was on a point of law I was examining, which in due course we will see how problematic it was. As I began running searches for variations on Medin, the problems only increased. What follows is my examination of what we've erroneously come to know as a nation called Midian. Section 1. The Oddities of Midian The first appearance of the word Medin, M-D-Y-N, translated as Midian, are to be found in Genesis 25, with complementary verses in 1 Chronicles 1. Genesis 25, 2, And she bare him Zimram, and Jokshan, 
and Medan, and Midian, and Ishbak, and Shua, and First Chronicles 1, 32. Now the sons of Keturah, Abram's concubine, she bare him Zimram, and Jokshan, and Medan, and Midian, and Ishbak, and Shua, and the sons of Jokshan, Sheba, and Dedan. Something very important here is that, specifically in Genesis, when a name of an early man is given, it should be noted, and unless evidence demonstrates otherwise, should be directly connected to the occurrences of that name as a nation thereafter. We see this most specifically throughout Genesis 10, and sparsely throughout the rest of the book. Genesis is foundational. All the people known as Goyim, or nations, are to be found, or at least their roots are to be found, therein. Abram's son by Hagar became the Ishmaelites. Abram's eldest grandson became Edom, and his younger grandson was Jacob Israel. But as I stated in the case of Midian, there is evidence that speaks strongly against the idea that this late-born son became what we read as the Midianites. Just a few verses after Medin is listed as being born to Abraham, we read Genesis 25, 5 and 6, And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac, but unto the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had. Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac his son, while he yet lived eastward unto the east country. He sent them away back east. He didn't want them near his son, whom the promises of Yahweh were unto, not the least of which was to inherit all the land of Canaan. He did this same thing with Yishmael, or Ishmael. Genesis 21, 11 14. And the thing was very grievous in Abram's sight because of his son. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad, and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And also of the son of the bondwoman, will I make a nation, because he is thy seed. And Abram rose up early in the morning, and he took bread and a bottle of water, and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. There was, however, a marked difference between Ishmael and Midian. Genesis 16.12, And he, Ishmael, will be a wild man, and his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. As we witness later in Scripture, all the nations proceeding from Abram, Isaac, and Jacob's brethren became enemies to Israel. Did Abraham understand that this would be a very real possibility and therefore sent his later sons away? It seems entirely plausible that that is the reason he did this, and if that were the case, one would think he would send them far. If one were tempted to think, but Yahweh promised to make Ishmael a nation because he was Abraham's seed. So why not his other children, such as Midian? The problem with that logic is that Keturah bare him six sons, yet we never hear a thing again about the other five. If indeed the Midian we see later is the Midian son of Abraham, Furthermore, when Abraham dies, he's buried not by all of his sons, such as was the case with Isaac and Jacob, but by his only two sons living nearby. Genesis 25, 9. And his sons Isaac 
and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, which is before Mamre. But this is only the start of the oddities of Midian. The next time we see Midian is in Genesis 36, 35, which is giving a rather long lineage of Esau, the Horites, and Edom. And by the time we see Midian, the timeline has us pretty far into the future from Abraham's day. So, let's look at the next chronological reference, which occurs in Genesis chapter 37. Abraham's great-grandson Joseph has been accosted by his brothers, thrown into a pit, and they are deciding what they should do with him. Then we read, Genesis 37, 25-27, And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Mitzrim. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. The outstanding oddity of this passage is, were they Ishmaelites or Midianites? It's tempting to try to deal with this question by thinking, Maybe it were Midianites who took him up from the pit, and then they, the Midianites, sold him to Ishmaelites. The problem with that is found a few verses later. Genesis 37-36 And the Midianites sold him into Mitzrim, unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's, and captain of the guard. Rest assured, these Ishmaelites are being referred to also as Midianites. This may be explainable, however. After all, Jacob is called a Syrian, or more accurately, an Arame, once in Deuteronomy 26, 5, quote, And thou shalt speak and say before Yahweh thy God, An Arame ready to perish was my father, and he went down into Mitzram, and sojourned there with a few, and became there a nation, great and mighty and populous. Closed quote. After all, Jacob had lived in Arim for twenty years. Perhaps it's the case that the Ishmaelites lived in Midian, or vice versa. This could explain these strange passages, except that, for one, we never see Ishmael having a defined geographical expression named Ishmael. And for another, how old would one expect Midian, Abraham's son, to be by now? Old enough, and with enough sons to already have formed a nation bearing his name? Midian had to be about Jacob's age, if not younger, and by this time, and with two wives and two concubines, Jacob only had twelve sons and one daughter, and the eldest can't be much over thirty. Is it believable that in that time Midian would have reproduced and grown enough to have either a geographical expression or a noteworthy tribe? Israel's sons weren't even solidified into a nation until after spending some time in Mitzram. Ishmael, by this time, would have grown a great deal. He had twelve sons, for starters, was fourteen years older than Isaac. Isaac didn't begin having any children until his forties, and his younger son Jacob also didn't start having sons until around the same age. And by Genesis 37, his eldest is only just in his thirties. These Ishmaelites would have been Ishmael's grand and great-grandchildren. He's had plenty of time to multiply, and we have every reason to understand why his descendants would be nearby and blessed with many children. We have no reason to believe this about Midian, who besides for only having five sons, who we never hear of, except for one once 
in Isaiah, maybe, was maybe around Jacob's age. I would have to say, if I'm to believe the Medin, Midian here, is the same as Abraham's late coming son, this passage doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But, as with Jacob being referred to as an Aramee in Deuteronomy, maybe. We could probably just shrug it off and tell ourselves, there must be a reasonable explanation for this, and that would suffice until we come to the life of Moses. Moses, as most know, was raised in Mitzram, in the house of Peroah, or Pharaoh, but always knew he was an Obrim, or Hebrew. So according to Exodus 2, 11 through 14, one day he goes out to visit his brethren and sees a Mitzri beating an Obri. So he kills the Mitzri and hides the body but finds out afterwards that he was seen. So he runs from Proa, Pharaoh, who is now bent on killing him. And we read Exodus 2.15. Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Technically, the text read that he dwelt at the bar, which may well be a proper name, but either way, he meets there the daughters of a man called Reuel, or or Reguel, H7467, and also Jethro, H3503 in Strong's, the priest of Midian from Exodus 2.16. So here we see, quote, land of Midian, and quote, priest of Midian. So certainly, Midian is either a geographical expression based on the only Midian we are aware of with a definite people, except Judges 4.11. Now Heber the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had severed himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent unto the plain of Zanaim, which is by Kadesh father-in-law in in this passage should be translated simply as in-law, as Hobab was Moses' brother-in-law. So we see Hobab, the son of Reuel Jethro, is called a Kenite, not a Midianite. This is confirmed in 1 Samuel 15, 6, quote, And Saul said unto the Kenites, Go, Depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Mitzrim. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. This is true. The Kenites, being Hobab and Raoul's kin, were the one people who dealt kindly towards Israel in the wilderness. Now, if this ethnic oddity weren't strange enough, there's also this. Numbers 12.1 And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Cushit, Cushi woman, whom he had married, for he had married a Cushit, or Cushi woman. Now, this is just bizarre. Which is it? Midianite, Kenite, or Cushite? Upon reading this, I was tempted to consider whether Moses had taken another wife. But after reflecting, the question would be, when and under what circumstances would Moses, appointed by Yahweh to lead his millions of Israel from Mitzrim, the calling, the plagues, the exodus, the parting of the Sup Sea, the complaints of the people, the battles, the commandments, the law. When did he sneak in a new wife? No, this regarded Zipporah, or Zipporah, as her father had just brought her back to Moses at Sini, or Sinai, and they were not far out from journeying 
from Sinai to Kadesh. Now, if Zipporah was a Cushite, how could she have both a Kenite brother and be a Midianite? Is there any sensible answer? Yes, there is. The Kenites were a people that had no nation. They lived among other peoples, and Cush bordered Mitzram, Ezekiel 29.10. I cover Cush's location extensively in my forthcoming book. How likely is it, if Midian was where we are forced to believe it was, being somewhere east of the Dead Sea on a Palestinian landscape, that Moses would be leading a flock all the way into the Sinai Peninsula, and for what? Was he a fool? Even per the actual geography of Canaan and surrounding lands, if Midian was a geographical expression, it would have to be near Moab and likely northeast of it. It still doesn't make sense that he would be in that area and lead Jethro's flock where he did. The logical answer here is that Raoul Jethro and his daughters and son Hobab were Kenites who lived in a Medin of Cush. A Medin of Cush? As in? As in a province, territory, or midlands of H4082 and H4083, used 55 times in total as provinces. But these two points thus far may not yet be convincing enough, so we will examine Midian in the context of Moab. Beginning in Numbers 22, Israel is traveled from Kadesh, sometimes Kadesh Barnea, skirted Edom and Moab, and are camping in a region oft referred to as Eretz Moab, or Land of Moab, though it isn't Moab proper. We know that because in Deuteronomy 2, 9-25, through Israel is forbidden by Yahweh to infringe upon the land of Moab and the land of Ammon, because Yahweh has given those lands to the children of of Lot. Notice, Yahweh never commands them to not infringe on Midian, a son of Abraham. Nor does the text in either Numbers or Deuteronomy tell us Israel was near to the borders of Midian. Yet, Midian had to be near. It was the Midianite women who drew the Israels away after their so-called gods. If Midian were a geographical expression of a particular nation, they would absolutely have to be right next to Moab. In Genesis 36-35 and 1 Chronicles 1-46, we read, Genesis 36-35, And Hushim died, and Hadad, the son of Bedad, who smote Midian in the field of Moab, reigned in his stead. And the name of his city was Avith. And 1 Chronicles 146 says the same. It would be odd to smite Midian in the field of Moab if Midian were not near, or at least in the direction, of Moab. But these are only supporting verses of the bigger picture of Midian's relationship to Moab found in Numbers and Deuteronomy. In Numbers 22, the Israelites have just conquered Sihun, the king of the Amorites, and the children of Israel are camping in the plains of Moab. But they haven't disobeyed Yahweh's command to not infringe upon the land of Moab. How is this? It is because outlying lands would typically be called of the nearest place that had any influence thereon. We often see this with Midbar, wilderness of, then the place name, like Midbar 
Kadesh or Midbar Yehuda. That doesn't mean that if one sets foot there, that they've infringed upon them. These are the outlying lands, or when other nations with definite borders are nearby, they would be the Midlands. These lands would likely be frequently disputed, which we have seen even in our own day. This is how borders often change on our maps. Midlands, Midian. That's interesting. So while Israel is encamping in the orbit plains of Moab, the king of Moab conspires with the elders of Midian to hire Balaam to curse Israel. When this action fails, Numbers 31.16, as well as Revelation 2.14, tells us Balaam had advised Balak king of Moab, to cast a stumbling block before Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and engage in illicit sex with the women of Moab. Or is it the women of Midian? That's the question, isn't it? The first verse of Numbers 25 reads, And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom, with the daughters of Moab. But within a few short verses, there's this from Numbers 25, verse 6. And, behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And thereafter, we read of nothing but the Midianites and Midianitish women. Where did Moab go? Even after the affair is over, and Yahweh tells Moses his last duty is to exact vengeance upon them who led Israel astray, they go after Midian, but not Moab. And here I thought Moab was the one behind all this. To further complicate the matter, in Deuteronomy 23, 1-8, when Yahweh is instructing Israel via Moses on who may or may not enter into his quell or special assembly, I was expecting to find Midian. But Midian isn't to be found. No, Yahweh says... Deuteronomy 23, 3 through 6, an Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of Yahweh, even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of Yahweh forever, because they met you not with bread and with water in the way when you came forth out of Mitzrim and because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, of Pethor, of Aram, of rivers, to curse thee. Nevertheless, Yahweh thy God would not hearken unto Balaam, but Yahweh thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee, because Yahweh thy God loved thee. Thou shalt not seek their peace, nor their prosperity, all thy days forever. Imagine my chagrin to not only not see Midian in there, but to also see Ammon. What, after all, did Ammon have to do with this? Is there any way to make sense of this? How unjust this seems. But Yahweh is not unjust. What, then, is the truthful and reasonable solution? It is most certainly, as we just read, that Moab and Ammon were the perpetrators of the malevolence against Israel in the matter of Baal Peor. And it is most certainly, as we read in Numbers, that Israel was carousing with Midianite women. And we see further evidence of this in the matter undertaken by Jephthah in Judges 11. Therein, 
the Israelites of Gilead, the region, also those of the sub-tribe Gilead, of the tribe Manasseh, be careful not to confuse the two, as the Gileadites of Manasseh lived in the Gilead region, which took its name from Jacob's pact with Laban in Genesis 31. They asked their brethren, or brother, Jephthah, to intercede with Ammon. Ammon! concerning the matter of the land Israel took from Sion, king of the Amorites, as Ammon claimed it was theirs. Now, if Ammon claimed the region called Gilead was theirs, and Numbers 21 tells us Sihun took it from Moab, and again, there's no word from Midian on the matter, and Jephthah doesn't, tell Ammon they never had any stake in Gilead, then it's fair to believe Ammon, as well as Moab, occupied the region of Gilead before Sihon. These were obviously contested lands. Strong's H4066 Madun, H4079 Medin, and, and H4090 Medin are all translated as strife, contention, discord, brawling. And since we know how Gilead was a contended land, does this now help us understand how Ishmaelites coming from Gilead in Genesis 37 would be called Midianites, as that region was contended land? And Yahweh instructed that both Ammon and Moab were barred from his special assembly for all time over the matter of Baal Peor. Although, from Numbers 25 through 31, all we read about in the matter is Midian. Is it not fair now to say that the Midianites were in fact Moabites and Ammonites who lived in the provinces, H4082 and H4083, or the Medine, or contended over lands. Is this not the proper understanding of why and how Hadad, the son of Bedad, smote Midian in the field of Moab, as Shaddai field? is also a common of term, which pertains often to outlying lands, field of Moab from Genesis 36-35, or field of Ai from Joshua 8-24, or field of Edom from Judges 5-4. Yet another situation that requires strong consideration is that of Judges 6-8, Gideon and Midian. The two very odd things about this narrative are, one, Midian's numbers, and two, Midian's retreat. Their numbers are a problem, since in the book of Numbers, chapter 31, Israel absolutely decimated the Midianites. They slew all their men, verse 7, killed their kings, verse 8, burnt all their cities and castles, verse 10, <laughs> in a desert, really, and took all their cattle, beasts, possessions, and women, verses 9, 11, and 12. They were then commanded to kill all the women who had known a man, like the women who were carousing with them, but to keep the virgins for themselves. If this were a specific people and specific geographical nation, they weren't any more, unless all is unclear here. This is not among the verses in which Kull, H3605, or all, needs further qualification. Israel decimated the people who were responsible for the matter of Baal Peor the Midianites. 
But as Judges 7.12 attests, quote, And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along the valley like grasshoppers for multitude, and their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. As the narrative from chapters 6 through 8 tells us, the Midianites were among the chief offenders as far as numbers and leadership, but yet Israel utterly decimated Midian only about a century before. Did they forget someone? Did they only destroy a portion of the Midianite kingdom that apparently must have been quite vast? Vast enough that their borders are not once mentioned. No telling of Israel going from Kadesh to Shittim mentions them having to go around Midian or being near the borders of Midian. Strange. And here is Midian, like grasshoppers or sand on the seashore, without number. Now, don't think I've forgotten about the Amalekites or the Bani Kadem, children of the east. I haven't. They certainly could account for the vast numbers of men recorded in Judges 7.12, but not for the direction they flee towards. In Judges 8, 3-8, Gideon is pursuing two kings of Midian, and in the opposite direction than where other earlier verses seem to indicate Midian would be as a geographic expression. When enemies retreat, they tend to retreat to their own land. But if Midian is near Moab, as other texts would suggest, it's inexplicable as to why these kings would head in the opposite direction. They had no foes ahead of them to cut them off, and no other reason given in the text as to why they would do something so counterintuitive, unless they headed towards their home after all, being Medin, a province or contended territory. On this point, some may be tempted to say, perhaps Midian is north in Gilead, and I've misinterpreted all the other texts, but that cannot be. The first reason is that Reuben, Gad, and half Manasseh occupied all Gilead, as per Deuteronomy 4 and Joshua 13, besides all the former evidence to this point and the following passage, 1 Kings 11, 14-18. And Yahweh stirred up an adversary unto Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. He was of the king's seed in Edom. For it came to pass when David was in Edom, and Joab the captain of the host was gone up to bury the slain, after he had smitten every male in Edom. For six months did Joab remain there with all Israel, until he had cut off every male in Edom. That Hadad fled, he and certain Edomites of his father's servants with him, to go into Mitzram, Hadad being yet a very little child. And they arose out of Midian and came to Paran, and they took men with them out of Paran and came to Mitzram, unto Pharaoh king of Mitzram, which gave him a house and appointed him victuals and gave him land. Based on this passage, there's no chance Hadad would go to Midian on his way to Mitzrim. Not a Midian in Gilead, nor one by Moab. It does, however, fit perfectly if he was in a province of Edom and left from there to Paran and then to Mitzrim. There's no other way. At this point, some again may be tempted to think maybe Midian is like the Canaanite in the sense of various cities of, in various numerous places, but this thought cannot answer the Moabite and Baal Peor issue 
which is so conclusive as to leave little doubt as to whether Midian was in fact Moab and Ammon. And that being the case, that thought quickly loses its weight. Section 2. The Provinces As already stated, there are really three ways in which variations of Medin are used in Scripture. As Midian, a perceived nation, as strife, contention, etc., and as province or provinces. Province could just as well have been translated as district, territory, colony, or domain. Concerning the understanding of Medine, province, 1 Kings 20 proves this is not necessarily a land held by an ethnically foreign ruler. 1 Kings 20 and 19. So these young men of the princes of the provinces, Medina, came out of the city and the army which followed them, and they slew every one his man, and the Aramee fled, and Israel pursued them, and Ben-Hadad, the king of Arim, escaped on a horse with his horsemen. The provinces, or Medinut in this case, would have been all the cities and governance around Shomron, or Samaria, which Samaria had direct control over and offered protection for in a time of war. They had a great deal, obviously, and this would be why such a large area of the kingdom of the house of Israel became known simply as Samaria. In this case, the Medinut, which is the plural of Medine, would be cities slash lands under the direct dominion of Samaria, likely with special privileges and special duties. The Medine, with the generalized e ending, would be places that, for whatever reason, were either currently under another authority or that had traditionally been places that changed hands. The reason that early in the scriptures we see mostly Medin, M-D-Y-N, and later we see mostly Medine, with the e ending, is that as these various nations grew, lands that were once territories of contestation became more permanently absorbed into nations that now had more stable boundaries, and places that gained a reputation for fluctuating between outside governments for whatever reason would become generally known as Medine, or Madanut in the plural. But what about the differences in form? Medine as opposed to Medine. Isn't that significant? I would ask what the difference is between Midbar and Midbara, H4057, as both are translated wilderness or <laughs> desert when the text just has to sound more Middle East-like. How is it that H6790, Tsan, different from Tsane. Both are translated as Zin. It's the same place, same thing, simply with an E ending, which has a softening or generalizing effect as in the general area of, or the general idea of. Tsan equals Zin proper, as opposed to Tsane, equaling the whereabouts of Zin. How about H2022, Er, or Ere? Both are translated as mount or mountain. Genesis 14.6, and the Horites, in their mount Er, Sier, unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And Genesis 14.10, and the vale of Sidim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountain, Ereh. In the preceding verses, 14.10 should have read the area of the mountain, 
or something similar. Even more appropriate would be a comparison with a word like tzedek, righteousness, a state of being right or just, as H6664 tzedek is used far more as the specific, as in just weights, just judgment, the just law. But as H6666 K with the E ending, it is righteous or righteousness as in a state of or just in general. Quote, and he believed Yahweh, and it was counted to him for righteousness, tzedakeh, from Genesis 15.6. This is the case with an innumerable amount of so-called nouns. The difference being only in how specific the author intends to be concerning that noun. Was the law tzedek just? This is specific. Was a man, Sedeke, just? This is general. How then would it apply to Medin? Medin would be a place with an accompanying people which would be considered a place of contestation due to geography or any other important factor. A Medine would be a place with an accompanying people that very well could be under contestation, but is instead being ruled over in at least relative peace. The E at the end doesn't change the meaning, but the intensity. It's not currently under contestation, but is a place or thing contested over. This is why Jeremiah in Lamentations 1.1 groups Jerusalem in with other provinces, Madanut, because she was by then and for some time now a contended over place. Solomon ruled over various provinces from Ecclesiastes 2.8 and 5.8. These were lands contended for by him his father David, and his successors. There is very little difference in the minds of the writers of Scripture between Medin and Medine, other than its current state of being. The biggest difference is whether a Jewish Masoret or translator with either good or bad intentions wishes it to be either contention slash strife province, or Midian. Section 3. Root Family and Cognates A relatively quick look at the possible roots and likely etymology of Medin to Medine will help to solidify what is being expressed when we see Medin, though it appears to us in most translations as Midian. The only two possibilities for roots are either med, md, or den, dn. The med root can be positively identified in three simple words. H4055, med, noun, translated as garment, armor, measure, raiment, judgment, a, a variant, or clothes. H4058, madad, MDD, a verb, translated as measure, meet out, to meet, or stretched. And H4060, made, with that E ending, as a noun, translated as measure, piece, stature, size, meat yard, garments, tribute, or wide. It isn't likely, though, that Medin takes its root from this family, as the majority of words listed with an apparent yn suffix have a very close meaning to the simple root made up of the glyph 
immediately preceding and succeeding the Y, such as an, an, and ein, a y n, or n e n, or ein e y n, and shaten, which would be the sha t n, or shatin sha t y n. These pairs of words, all having similar or the same translation or meaning. In addition, many words listed with an apparent y-n suffix will often appear in the text either with or without the y before the n and translated successfully in the same or virtually the same way. What this indicates is that the root is likely contained in those two glyphs immediately preceding and succeeding the y. In this case, it occurs in the latter part of Medin, Dan, Dan, H1777, as a verb translated as to judge, to plead the cause, to contend, to execute, to plead, or to strive. This root has many cognates all with similar meanings and uses, and it will appear as Dan Dn Dean Dyn Dun Dun Dene Dne and only change meaning slightly. M is an extremely common prefix that tends to change the usage of the root it's added onto from an action, attribute, or noun into a more precise thing. Arab, a verb, meaning to ambush, as opposed to ma-arab, a noun, meaning ambushment, or bua, a verb, to enter, versus mabua, a noun, meaning an entrance, or bahar, a verb, meaning to choose, as opposed to ma-bahar, a noun, meaning a choice etc., etc., etc. Dean, D-Y-N, meaning to judge, contend, strive, becomes Madin, a thing contended, a thing judged, a thing striven over. This, of course, fits the idea of a province or outlying lands or borderlands. Medine, province, doesn't appear until 1 Kings 2014. Medine was the logical progression from the earlier Medin, as the once more constantly contended borderlands or outlying property achieved a more steady state, as opposed to being in flux. Locations that were once in greater states of contention, but had become more stable, though still typically ruled over by another people or city, would simply go from being considered Medin, M-D-Y-N, a contested thing, to Madine, M-D-Y-N-E, a stable province. Summary. In the end, it's always a worthwhile endeavor to look into why anyone was named as they were, and Medin, or Midian, as it's transliterated by Masoretic Dictate, being one of Abraham's late-in-life children, is no exception. But at least now, having an understanding of what Madin, Medin, Medun, Medine, denote and connotate, it will make considering the circumstances of that son of Abraham become at least a little bit more understandable. The great takeaway here is the lack now of confusion about who and what a number of people who are labeled as Midianites, as though they were a distinct nation with a distinct geographical expression, actually were. They are various people 
sometimes Moabites and Ammonites, sometimes Cushites or Edomites, and living in contested territories, borderlands, and in sometimes homogeneous governance, such as Samaria and its Madanut, or provinces. Does this have strong implications on the text as it currently stands? Of course it does. It affects geography, ethnology, and the law, among other things, but to properly understand this is to have real knowledge, which is great power. A power that bad translators, deliberate or accidental, have taken away from us. Often revelations like this one are difficult to cope with, especially if one has built a theological system around the old faulty way, but those who truly love the truth will find a way to incorporate this newly found understanding into their biblical and world views, as no truth is really new, but has just gone unknown for some time. I'm not pioneering, after all, but merely rediscovering. This is restoration. Yes, the enormous gain to this is the greater understanding one will now possess in all matters. Matters of geography, matters of law, matters of politics and social dynamics. And all understanding gained about Scripture is empowering. This new knowledge will give us greater power against critics, against false assumptions and erroneous teachings, and against contrived histories, phony discoveries, and questionable deuterocanonical texts. Is there yet any translation that is aware of this problem? Not that I'm aware of. But we can hope that responsible translators will consider this new information and work to generate better, more accurate translations. All who read or hear this can rest assured that an Obery Project translation is certainly on the horizon and will not falter on this and so very many other vital points. For now, Keep in mind that context is ever critical, and arm yourself with the knowledge that H4066 and 68 Madun, H4079 through 81 Madin, H4081 through 83 Madine, H4084 Madini, H4090 Madin, and H4092 Madini are all very similar in form and therefore usage. We've seen ample evidence that speaks against the idea that we are looking at a defined people from the latter sons of Abraham, as well as abundant evidence that Medin is a contested territory and Medini or Midianites are simply the peoples identified with those territories, like provincials, or colonists, or settlers. In all things, stay vigilant and wary of most translations brought to us, in large part by conversos and Shabbos Goy Pharisees. None of this is easy on the reader or the researcher but it's the due diligence we must exercise for the sake of those who come after us, those who are counting on us to turn the world of lies and darkness into a world of light and truth. I'm relying as much on all of you as you are on me, so I expect you to look into this matter for yourself. Don't simply believe me or anyone, but prove all things. For the Obery Project, I'm John MacTemus, bidding you kind regards and Godspeed.